You guys liked, if it's okay with your parents, if you're under six, sixth grade, up to sixth grade, if you'd like to go to Sunday school class. It'd be worth your while. It's hard to meet new people, but you'd like it. <laughs> okay, good morning. Hey, Charles. Morning. Um, open up to Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Okay, now on. Proverbs 8. Uh, just begin the first verse. We'll read down to verse 17. I'm just going to be looking at verse 17 particularly and a few other verses, but we'll start at verse 1. Proverbs 8. Uh, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her, her voice? She, standing in the top of high places, by the way in the places of, of the paths, uh, she crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming, and at the doors. Uh, unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be of understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall uh, be right things. Uh, for my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. Uh, they are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. Uh, receive my instruction, and <coughs> not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Uh, counsel is mine, and sound wisdom is mine. I am understanding. I have strength. By me kings reign and princes decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Then verse 18, riches and honor are with me, ye durable riches, du durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice uh, silver. We can continue on to the uh, to the end of the chapter, really, but uh, what we've been discussing as far as our Sunday school, uh, we're in a series uh, that we started a few weeks ago uh, concerning revival, and uh, we have, for, for us here, uh, we have a series of meetings that we're going to have in the next upcoming weeks, um, and we wanted to look at just the subject and see what the Lord has to say about it and how we can best prepare ourselves for that, for what God has for us. Uh, during the week of meetings, and then uh, hopefully that we, we fruit, not just fruit unto righteousness, but every, you know, fruit that uh, remains, uh, that comes from the, uh, what God's going to do in us and through us during those set of meetings. Uh, now you're asking, okay, why are we in Proverbs? <laughs> uh, among other places, okay, right here, um, the Lord, um, just a little too loud for me, I'm sorry. The Lord is uh, describing. Uh, wisdom, and he's um, basically saying, okay, this is my desire for you with regard to you having understanding of his, his will in your life. Uh, that's the immediate application. Uh, but the principle uh, with regard to verse 17 still remains the same as far as you seeking out God, and that is uh, what we're looking at today as far as seeking God. Uh, we've been following an outline um, from, well, uh, there's an evangelist named by John, uh, the name of John Van Gelder that has written a, a book which originally came out of a series of sermons that he had preached uh, called um, The Revival Journey. And so in it, he outlines basically what would be steps within the journey of somebody that would be pursuing revival. And it usually starts off with, first one is, there's got to be something more. There's a realization that, hey, there's more to life than what we are experiencing now, or there's more to my Christian walk than what I presently am finding. And so there's a desire, there's a hunger there, and then the next step would be a pursuit, or you're seeking God, which is what we're looking at today. Um, and so with that in mind, as far as seeking God, pursuing God, and then trying to find basically what God would have 
Um, we're looking at principles in his work with regard to that. What do you have to say about it and what, what do we do? Uh, so with regard to in Proverbs here when he talks about wisdom, now granted, um, it's not it limited exclusively and though the context immediately is toward wisdom, uh, the principle still remains is that he said in verse 17, uh, I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. So there's a initiation of pursuit on our part uh, to seek God and if we seek him earnestly, or that's the idea of the early, that I seek him earnestly, um, then I will find him. So those that would seek the Lord, he will be found of them. Uh, go to well, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Okay, we looked at this briefly last week. Um, we'll start in verse 19. Um, down to the end of the chapter, but verse 19, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Uh, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Uh, for where your treasure is, there where your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, uh, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body uh, shall be full of darkness. If therefore that darkness, or excuse me, if therefore that if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Okay, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and uh, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what, she, uh, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Uh, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Uh, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, uh, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are they not much better than? Are ye are ye not much better than they? Uh, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Uh, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Uh, therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Uh, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the uh, for for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is uh, the evil thereof. All right, it's a long passage, and uh, just to get the context, this is Jesus speaking, uh, basically, the Sermon on the Mount, and in the this is just a small portion of it, but this is Jesus speaking to a large crowd of folks, some believers, some unbelievers, and he's primarily addressing. Uh, it would be discipleship, or that is pursuing him, following him. And in the course of this, he addresses the fact that those that would seek him or those that would pursue him, those that would be disciples, uh, are to not be concerned. That is not to say that you don't obviously give thought to your responsibilities here and now, but I guess in contrast, you can say he's primary. Uh, and so that which we would concern ourselves with as he put there, that these are the things that the Gentiles seek. What am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? Uh, how am I going to take care of myself? Where am I going to live? And these things, uh, God's very capable of taking care of. Uh, and, I mean, that's a grand understatement. It's the creator of the world. By, all, by him, all things consist. So, I mean, obviously, he's more than capable of being able to take care of us. But we give time and attention to all these things, and we usually end up putting God on our back burner, or the things of God in the... Um, things concerning him and he would have it to be if we're going to be a disciple have him first have him primary have him be our our passion our pursuit and so when we seek God seek him earnestly or 
fervently uh, and then seek him first. Uh, Psalm 28. Psalm 28. Be not silent unto me, or be not silent to me, uh, lest if thou, if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands towards thy holy oracle. Uh, draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace uh, to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert, uh, because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them, and build them not. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. Uh, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth. With my song will I praise him. The Lord is their strength. Uh, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. Okay. Verses 1 and 2, and then verses, uh, well, verse 6 in particular. Verse 1 starts out basically as a prayer or as a desire. He's calling out to God. Unto thee will I cry, uh, be not silent unto me. And then he explains why he wants God to respond to him. He doesn't want to be destroyed. He doesn't want to end up basically being in a position of not being blessed. By the time we get to verse 6, he says, Blessed be the Lord, uh, because he hath heard the voice of my supplication. So in the turn from where he starts off to where he gets to verse 6, we have God responding to him. Um, and I know it seems silly, but like, uh, this is basically Matthew chapter 7, and then I think it's in Luke 6, where uh, ask, and it shall be given unto you, seek, and you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Uh, you call out to God, and I know this goes without saying, but uh, and again, this is not going to be something deep, but this is something I believe that will be helpful to us, that a lot of times we kind of either overlook, or maybe we don't really give much attention to. Uh, and again, we're Looking, we're looking to, okay, we want to hear from God. I want God, so I want to seek Him. So, uh, and this is really basic and simple, but we go to Him because He actually can do something about our position, our, our situation. He can actually help me. Right? The psalmist started out by making a plea to God, and God responded. God responds to prayers. Right? We call out to Him, and He's going to answer. Um, you want to seek God because he's going to do something. He's active. He wants to work. He wants to bless. Okay? God's not out. I know uh, it's easy to get in a negative mindset, especially with just everything that's going on in the world. And a lot of times just even our flesh has a tendency towards that. Uh, but the fact is, <laughs> I know Jesus said this about his earthly ministry, but his... He's still the same. His character is still the same. He hasn't changed. And that is that, you know, he came not to destroy lives, but he came to, <laughs> to save them. Right. You know, God is a giver of life. Uh, he produces things, and he wants to bless. He wants to be active in your life. A lot of times we don't see that because of our unbelief. Um, we just look at it. We, we look at it, and we read over the fact that, wow, he worked in in this great and mighty way in such and such person's life, or even we hear recent accounts of um, how he's blessed in whoever, you know, whoever's life, you know, on social media a lot, and we, you know, we fail to, you know, we fail to really grasp, you know, he's the same God, he can work in my life. There's nothing really, um, I guess you could say, <laughs> nothing special about somebody else, more so than what would be, you know, me. Um, Turn to, do, well, on, on that point, just to emphasize that. 
Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5. reading at verse 22. Uh, what I wanted to emphasize is down in verse 29, really, but we'll start at verse 22 so we get, we get the context established. Okay, these words the Lord spake unto your assembly in the mount of the midst of the fire. Now, these words are referencing what would have just been stated a little bit earlier in the chapter, which is he's recounting the actual law that was given uh, from Mount Sinai. Uh, to the congregation. This is the congregation being ready to go into the promised land. The old generations passed off, died off, and then, you know, Moses, uh, even though he's not going to be able to go in with them and lead them in, it's Joshua and Caleb, uh, and Lord, you know, pick Joshua to come and pick up along, but he's using Moses at this point in time before he passes over into um, Mount Pisgah, where he is giving, he's recounting the law, and he's preparing the, the congregation that is able to be able to go in for that. And so he just he literally just recounted the law to them. And so that's what he's referencing as far as these words speak um, speak the Lord unto the, all your assembly in the mount. Um, of the, in the mount of fire of the cloud of the thick darkness and with a great voice um, and he added no more. And he wrote uh, them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto, uh, delivered them unto me, uh, Moses speaking. And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me, even all the heads uh, of your tribes and your elders. And ye said, uh, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. That's amazing. Okay, now therefore, why should we die? Uh, right, well, I'll go back to that question, but keep that in mind. Now, this is the congregation saying this to Moses after they've just witnessed the fact that, okay, God's communicating with them personally. Uh, and then they're afraid of him. Um, For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then uh, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? I know this is kind of silly, but like, didn't just, was it, didn't, didn't they just live? In other words, they just literally experienced that. And they're not dead yet. So that's kind of a silly question. But anyways. All right. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. Now this is their command to Moses. And speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we shall hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when ye spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken unto thee. Uh, they have well said all that they have spoken. Now this is God's basically expression of his heart towards Moses with regard to what they said. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, uh, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. And then he's Further on, he's going to give them command as far as what, how they should handle from here forward in their communicating with him. So God's heart, God's desire was, you know, they tell me that they're going to seek me with all their heart. They're going to tell me that they're going to be obedient to me. And they have an actually objective recognition of the fact that, as with Isaiah later on, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, you know, and they would have seen him basically in his glory. Not quite as Isaiah, but they see on the side of the mount, the fire, the smoke. They hear the thundering of his voice. Uh, you have the tablets that are come forth with Moses as given by God. Uh, and that is, honestly, it's a, that become a frightening, awesome sight to see, the witness. And their response to that, uh, obviously natural flesh would be fear. But they question and they said, who's lived? Well, didn't they just live? 
I mean, seriously, if you think about it, if God wanted him dead, wouldn't he just do it? But he let them live. I mean, he exposed himself to them, show him his, show them his glory, uh, and they lived. So God wants to actually communicate with them. He wants to interact with them. Uh, they don't want to. Conjecture on my part would be because they like their sin more than they like to be in close relation or to be clean enough to be able to stand before him. Um, and then God's heart was that I wish, I really wish, I really wish, I really desire that they would have that hunger and that thirst for me to, to seek me or to continue in that. Now question, outside of the fact that Moses was actually called by God, what was the difference between Moses and the, and the actual people there? He was older. All the other babies were killed in his generation. Okay. <laughs> what else? <laughs> what distinguished him beyond his age and the fact that he was called? As far as his character, what was it then? Was there anything special? He'd seen God do work in, 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 in his earlier years. Okay. But they could have said the same thing too, right? I mean, they were sustained in the wilderness from their youth. They had the recounting of what their parents had seen when they crossed over from the Red Sea, or crossed through the Red Sea. They had a relationship with God. Okay. Why was that? Talk to him. We knew him. That's why. And why was that? God chose to reveal himself to him. Moses saw God. Yeah, he wanted to. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was it. He was older. He wa well, yeah, okay, yeah, he was older and all that, but the fact is, he wanted to know God. In other words, anybody that wanted to know God could know God as Moses did. Now, mind you, they wouldn't have had the call of God in their life like he did, but you can still have been close to him. There was nothing restricting. I mean, you look at Joshua and Caleb. What do we have of their history other than they believed God. There were two spies of the twelve that were sent out that actually believed God. But there was nothing really significant or special about their pedigree. They accompanied with everybody else that was there. They just said, you know what? <laughs> I want to know God. They were blessed. Um, okay. Um, actually, that was kind of a little bit of a trapper trail here. But that... If you want to know God, you can know Him. Okay, You're not restricted in your ability to be able to get close to Him. Um, you know, they that seek me shall find me. If you earnestly seek Him with all your heart, you can, you can be found. Um, Psalm 63. Psalm 63. <coughs> This is, as, actually this is part of the first verse, but it gives you an indication as far as when this was written and by who. Okay, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now, he was in the wilderness, obviously, because he was being hunted, uh, because he was anointed king, and then Saul was jealous and wanted to kill him. Uh, the psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. <laughs> And this is his heart's cry out. Uh, it says, O God, thou art my God, early or earnestly will I seek thee. Uh, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land uh, where no water is, uh, to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, uh, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I speak, or thus will I bless thee. While I live, I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. Now interesting. His satisfaction is going to come from his memories of seeing God's blessing in his life. Uh, verse 7. Because thou hast been my help, Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Uh, my soul followeth hard after thee. 
uh, thy right hand upholdeth me. Uh, but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. Uh, they shall fall by the sword, uh, they shall be a, a portion for foxes. Uh, but the king shall rejoice in God, every one that sweareth by him shall glory. Uh, but the mouth of them that speaketh lies shall be stopped. Okay, so he's expressing his heart's desire, and we know now not to discount his earlier life, um, but David sinned, uh, and he's not necessarily the best example to follow. Uh, he turned from God later, and uh, he would commit um, adultery with Bathsheba, and just ruined a lot of lives as a result of that. Did a lot of damage. But in his earlier life, uh, he was one that was known as a man after God's own heart. And that was actually God's assessment of him, God's description of him, when he was right with him, when he was pursuing God. And this would be something that we would seek, uh, not just to pray, but as far as to have, okay, God, help me to develop this as a mindset or an attitude that I would be one that seeks you passionately and mm -hmm. earnestly. Um, and here are his reasoning is that verse three, because thy loving kindness is better than life, then you know, my lips shall praise thee. Uh, he desires, verse two, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I've seen in the sanctuary. Uh, he wants to see God glorified. Um, it's one thing um, and again, <laughs> okay, I mean, this. All right, I'll say it like this. I'm not really sure how to express this, but it's great to hear and read of the accounts of God working in somebody's life, but it's much more precious when it's in my life. And again, not to discount God working in anybody's life, but I want that. <laughs> we should too. Um, and then his soul, he says, shall be satisfied with, as with marrow and fatness. And then my my uh, mouth shall praise thee with loving or with joyful lips. And then here is what provokes that out of him uh, when he remembers thee uh, upon my bed and meditating on thee in the night watches. So his meditation of God, his remembrance of God's working, of seeing God's blessing, of what he's been instructed on with regard to God's character that maybe he hasn't seen realized yet, but. He chooses to believe based on God's ability to back up what he says that he doesn't lie. He follows through on his word. And that though I have not seen this yet, I'm choosing to believe God wants to do this, can and very will do this, um, is, a, is a driving force for him that motivates him, that brings satisfaction to his soul and actually excites him, makes him, makes him happy, joyful. <laughs> So, in our pursuit of seeking God, keep in mind, um, we put Him first, we seek Him earnestly, He will respond, and God wants to work. Okay, God wants to be active in our life. Uh, Philippians 3, Philippians 3. There's other portions of scripture, I guess that best summarizes this, but for me it seemed like this is the New Testament equivalent, I guess you could say, a summary of this pursuit. Um, <coughs> verse 14 is actually what we're going to focus on. <laughs> That's the point, just so, but it, to get the context, you start basically at verse 1. But verse 14 is the focus. Uh, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof uh, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Okay, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Um, honestly, I don't know why he would brag about the fact of being from Benjamin. They were kind of a 
she and the crowd, they were actually almost, <laughs> no, well, they were, I mean, they were almost destroyed. And it was not for a good thing either. Um, but these these are something to brag about. And then, um, as, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, <laughs> he persecuted the church, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Wow. You can actually say that with clear conscience. Uh, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do suffer, excuse me, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, uh, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Uh, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of, or excuse me, of, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. And then, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, and the one thing that he actually does is verse 14, I press. That's, I press. Now, everything else that's mentioned a little bit before, which I'm getting ready to read, are modifiers to that main verb is pressing. So, um, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do while forgetting, or it could be understood as while forgetting. Uh, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, which in context is understood as being actually Christ likeness. So his pursuit, his passion is Christ likeness. Christ apprehended of him, you know, it, the love of Christ restrained him. In other words, God's love shown to him and pursued him and sought him when he was unsaved to be born again. And that's actually God's heart and God's passion as he expresses in Second Peter 3 where he says that you know he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance God's desire for people is to be not only just born again but that they would walk to him, walk with him uh, you know not, okay yeah and I'm not discounting people get saved but I'm just saying uh, it's a great and amazing thing when we see people get saved but God's not through with them that's not just okay boom you got saved great you got eternal life there's more God wants more you know God wants an active passionate relationship with him uh, and that's his desire that's the apprehension and then he follows after he made a conscious choice to go ahead and follow after Christ and the thing he does looking back and forgetting those which was you know which was behind and then looking forward and saying okay look God has something better for me I press I actually actively work very hard at seeking Christ like this thing be like God, seeking to be like Jesus, and then hear his 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 uh, his basically his impassioned crying to us, his, his command for us is, "Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, and that is not necessarily without sin, but that is uh, the idea is a fitness term is that you are what you should be. In other words, those that are mature spiritually. Uh, let us therefore, uh, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything." Uh, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So, um, if we are seeking to be mature Christians, if we're seeking to have God work in our life, we need to impassionately, or passionately pursue Him. Press, press toward the mark. Forget those things which are behind. Reach forth unto those things which are before. And press. Okay? actively, aggressively make a choice to press. Um, then he also later on talks about that um, if we have, well, let me, let me read it, I'm sorry, verse 16. Nevertheless, where until we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And then, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which so walk, or which walk so as ye have us for an, an example. So if you're having a difficult time even just trying to uh, process or imagine, okay, how do I actually practically live this out? Mark, or not, just make, make note of those folks that are actually successfully pursuing God in their life. And then 
they're, 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 they're basically going to be your object lesson. Okay, we don't follow men, because he would say, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. So the, the metric is basically, it's Christ as his word. But if, in, if in, in our pursuit of that, we need some aid, or, you know, there's some, um, some difficulty in understanding, you know, it's, it's good to seek help, seek accountability, seek counsel. Uh, and then mark those that, hey, these guys are, these guys are pursuing Christ. And in the manner as they are pursuing Christ, we, we seek. And again, it's limited, obviously, to his word. Uh, where they deviate from that, it's like, okay, boom, no. <laughs> I have my loyalty to the word of God. And uh, the reason why this is such an uh, important thing is, verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now even tell you weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now his description uh, is... <laughs> Is, is pretty hard hitting. It says, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, uh, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay? Um, a person can be deceived to thinking that they're pursuing Christ, um, but actually be carnally minded or earthly focused. Um, now, why I say that is you have folks that in word might say they're following Christ, but their behavior, their action, their attitude, their mentality, and a lot of some of, the, some of these things you can't really, you know, look at because I can only look on the action. God knows the heart. Uh, but as far as you can assess for yourself as to whether or not am I really actually passionately pursuing or am I just in word pursuing, uh, if I am not actually passionately pursuing, if I'm not minded as he said there, as with them that be the uh, are uh, that are perfect, um, that we are forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth until those things which are before. Um, we would end up being of those that whose God is our belly, so our carnal passions are the ones that are taking over. Uh, they glory in their shame. So in other words, that which would be glorious to me, or is something that I would be proud of to want to promote, is actually something that God would consider being shameful. Uh, and the summary of it is basically somebody that's earthly minded. Uh, you know, to be carnally minded is death. If you're earthly minded, God considers you, considers me, considers us basically uh, an enemy of the cross of Christ. You know, we were saved not just from the power of sin and its penalty, um, but we were saved from it altogether that we would, you know, work out his salvation, that we would work as instruments of, you know, we would be yielding ourselves as instruments of, of, of righteousness unto God to live out his glory, to glorify him. That's our purpose. So when we end up yielding to our flesh, not surrendering, just living carnally, uh, and that it's not limited to just like the extreme stuff of the, what we would think of the carousing and the drinking and that kind of stuff. It's just not having an eternal focus. And that's as much earthly minded as, as the, the guy in the, in the gutter, you know? Um, and the truth is, the end of that is destruction. That's not saying, okay, you're going to go to hell if you're born again because, you know, we know that we're eternally saved. But in other words, that's a wasted life. <laughs> that's wood, hay, stubble that gets burned up at the beam of <coughs> Um, that, that'd be a shame to, to have that, to be in that position. So, uh, in seeking God, uh, we are to seek Him first, seek Him earnestly. We call out to Him because He's actually going to respond. He's going to do something about it. And um, as Paul put it here, we have Him as our focus. We are to be... Uh, in Colossians it says it like this is that uh, seek those things which are above and not on the earth for our life is hid with Christ and God okay so he is our life um, I quote that right I'm sorry said so, um, if you be risen uh, with if you then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above uh, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God set your affections on things above not on things of the earth for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God and then when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory.
then he goes on to explain as far as how you do that by mortifying your members and such, and then walking in the spirit, as in Ephesians, yielded, yield, being yielded. Um, so, in summary, uh, we are seeking uh, to have God work in our midst, and we want genuine revival. Now, something that we can't really do is plan it necessarily. Uh, we can uh, set the stage, but it's actually a work that God does in our hearts. But it's in response to our desire. It's our, in a sense, in our response to our active choice to pursue. And he says, if we seek him, he's going to be found. You know. So, in conclusion, you know, do you want God? You know, do you <laughs> do you want him to work in your life? Do you want him to do great and mighty things? Um, listen, he's not limited. He's not in any way obstructed outside of our unbelief. Uh, that's the only thing that really shackles God from actively working in our life. Uh, so, this week, um, um, I forget, I failed to mention this last week, but it was, I would suggest one praying prayer as in uh, Psalm 139, uh, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me, and then, you know, lead me in the way of ever everlasting. Ask God to reveal anything in your heart that would be obstruction to Him working it. Obviously, seek to correct that. And then, two, make a determined effort, a choice, even if it's just getting up and, you know, saying, God, help, help me. You know, I need you. And if you actively make steps to pursue Him, you draw an eye to Him, He's going to draw an eye to you. All right. uh, any questions? What do you think, time-wise, a Christian who is basically going from, you know, we call it in running couch to 5K, or from, you know, a Christian who's gone from being really in a dead state spiritually, if you want to see revival in your life, what do you think time-wise ought to be an investment as far as, like, how much? How much time? Yeah, like, just... Oh, like, like uh, how, how long it'll take for a I mean, I know we need to be meditating on, you know, we need to be thinking on spiritual things when you be living and we and we do have to live on a daily basis but how much dedicated time of focusing on revival uh, do you think that we ought to not invest honestly it's a little hard <laughs> to answer um, we're not we don't all have the same amount of responsibilities I mean like I for me it'd be a little easier to put a lot more time than say somebody that's mother that's got six kids, especially if she's homeschooling, because that's, <laughs> that's it's just, I can't relate to that. Like, I don't know, you know, that schedule. Um, but I would imagine that'd be a lot more occupied hey, with you, I'm personal time. But address this in the next week or so, but when does revival or, or seeking revival go from an individual to a corporate? If, as far as people coming together, praying and uh, oh, seeking see. God's face and that sort of thing. Okay. When, like as far as preparation goes, when is a time when it seems like as a as a body or as a group you seek revival as opposed to as an individual? Would it be just when there's more than one individual who's in revival? Um, I have an easier time answering that question as far as on a personal level. Personal level, usually God brings to my attention or there's a thirst, there's a hungry, there's a, there's a, there's, it's like, okay, there's something missing. So and then at that point, it's like, I need, I need, I need God, I need something, I need you to be in my life. When I'm revived, I personally believe, okay, now you're like, okay, then we can branch out towards a corporate where, hey, I'm in a state where I'm actually not being detrimental to my brothers and sisters. I want to encourage them and motivate them as in Hebrews, uh, you know, provoke a, provoke one another unto love and good works. And so at that point, you you seek, okay, hey, you seek somebody that would be like-minded and be like, okay, look, listen, these are areas or issues that I see that maybe either could be addressed or maybe need addressed or maybe they're burdening me personally. And let's seek God about it. And 
you know, where two or three are gathered my name there, I'm in the midst. I don't see that you would need to have a big group necessarily, even though that is encouraging. And that would be nice. But the thing is, that if you have one other person where you are seeing, where you, if you're in the rate in a revived state, you see, okay, hey, look, there's issues or things that I, I think maybe could be addressed or need addressed, or we, we really need God's touch here at that point, I would say. Does that answer your question or no? Yeah, I'm just trying to think of a plan for revival. In other words, oh. say say as a, as a ministry, we, we realize, hey, listen, we're going through the motions, but we're not we're not anything like what we ought to be. And we don't, we don't love the Lord like we should. Could, could a group of individuals commit to personal revival and then give themselves an amount of time to come together and really seek I would say, yeah, I would, I mean, I don't... Don't you like, think God could just answer your prayer in an instant as far as personal revival? I mean, could it happen really fast? Yeah, I mean, I don't, he's not limited by anything, I mean, outside of our own belief, but there's, um, as far as the time, I don't know, like, necessarily, he's prescriptive as far as, okay, you'd have to do it for this amount of days or months or weeks before, you know, I actually come down. Right? The I guess I guess one of the questions I would have is would you say that probably revival would be continuous if it were not for individual hindrances? In other words, it would be more about hindrances than God withholding his hand. Because there would be reasons why there isn't revival in an individual's life. Lack yeah. of love or you know, love and love like you said, love in the world. And then maybe sin. Yeah, I mean even um, church at Ephesus, they um, they lost their first love. Like he, well, I guess I could, that would be a sin. I was gonna say he didn't really rebuke him necessarily for anything. Like he would have, like if you were to compare, you, they're not able to see it. They would have been doing everything right. They just lost their passion, their heart. They're just going through emotion, and they're actually what they would have they just were like well, okay this is routine now rather than an impassioned relationship so I've relegated God to just okay an activity rather than just like okay I, I, I'm actively engaging with you as a person um, I don't I don't see there being any hindrance as far as like um Time-wise, or you know, he could answer right away. To answer, you know, <laughs> so you cry out to him, you know, and you want it. You know, there might be behavior things that maybe need worked out. Hi, good morning, morning, um, morning. But I don't see there being anything as far as being hindrance with regard to that. All right, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Does anybody else have any questions? I guess uh, if not, we're uh, dismissed.